scoot up for a second and let's talk. Yo, DJ, roll that beautiful champagne footage. you crazy bitches waiting one more fucking second i'm gonna give you story time about how i caught my husband cheating on me in cabo with his dumbass boys okay and i also want to preface this whole thing by stating like you fucking psychotic bitches went crazy in the comments you're like yes queen slay city girl i, d I don't even know what that means but <laughs> i'll take it you're like she cheated on her husband with his best friend fuck that dude Fuck that dude. Love the fucking energy in the chat, guys. Never let it die. This is top tier feminism. Anyway, we had been married for a little over a year. No, that's not true. I think we were on year two. I don't fucking remember. We stripped to Cabo, which I didn't have any clue about until the very last minute. And don't come for me saying, babes, that's a red flag. Nair, nair, that's a red flag. I know. I'm crazy too. <laughs> like, I like this shit. Anyway, I'm sitting at home working on my laptop and uh, he left his email logged in on his Google account for some reason, I don't know. And a little alert popped up and it just popped up and said, your tender verification something. And I was like, this crazy motherfucker. This, you wanna play this game? Like that's immediately what went down in my head. I was like, let's go. So like the creepy bitch I am, I screenshotted his Instagram followers and then compared it like every 30 minutes. So I finally came across this girl who was currently in Cabo and uh, I was like, I'm gonna DM her. <laughs> and so I hit her up, I was like, hey, you're hot as shit. I like your boobs. I'll, I'll post a screenshot or something. And um, I just wanna let you know, like I know you met my husband on Tinder. Again, no harsh feelings. I don't give a fuck. Um, just wanna let you know he's married, but if you guys do fuck, like send me videos or something so I can have it as ammo. With her little ugly girl spirit, she was like, you're fucking crazy. So I just screenshotted it and waited for him to come home and I kinda just like, you know, played it out for a minute. I played the game, let him buy me a few nice things. And then whenever I was like, mm, I'm still angry. Yeah, I, uh, I decided to sleep with his best friend. And I know there's a couple incels in my comments being like, how long were you waiting for that? Like, obviously it was pre-planned. Oh, honey, I've never waited for dick in my life. Ever. <laughs> Ever. I would never. And honestly, our divorce story just gets fucking crazier and crazier um, because I am batshit. And whenever I'm angry, I just like don't let it go. And I, I like that part of me. I meditated on it for a little bit. And then I was like, Erica, just fucking unleash the beast. <laughs> and the whole story is fucking crazy. I could do a like 12 part series on it. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. I love you guys. Crazy day. Um, as some of you know, I caught my husband cheating on me in Cabo with his boys. So we are not standing for that shit. Um, and this is what's going down. So this is me the morning after I uh, slept with my husband's best friend. After okay, so I'm back for part three. And it's not really going to be part three because I feel like I'd have to go in order and I don't want to do a prequel to the fucking, I don't know. You know what I'm saying. I've been busy writing my new book. Check it out. Anyway, my favorite question I've got so far um, is, does he know? Does your ex-husband know? that you did this terrible, terrible thing? Um, the answer is he's probably going to know soon. I'm assuming because of the reach that that TikTok had. It's all relatively strategic. I've had this burning a hole in my pocket for about a year. Fucking crazy. And I just thought, mm, why not just fucking, it's time. It's about that time. And I know he probably does not give one fuck about me and that's totally okay. I hope he's doing well, whatever. Um, but I was left with a little bit of uh, a sprinkle of trust issues, you know? And I just don't think that's fair. So now I know the person that I hooked up with is never gonna say anything. He's never gonna cough up to it. I'm never gonna say anything about who it was. Um, but now he'll know that one of his friends is not one of his friends, but he will never know who. So undoubtedly, Will that leave him with some trust issues? Absolutely. Is this narcissistic behavior? 
Absolutely. I never claimed to have great morals or ethics or values. I never said I didn't have sociopathic tendencies. Never said any of that. And I did say, don't fuck this up. I'm pretty sure in my vows I literally said, you don't want to fuck this up. Just kidding, we never had vows. And that's all for today. See, this is the kind of stuff that goes real bad, real fast. But see, these are the individuals that you fall for on both sides. You want a woman with no morals, psychopathic tendency. This is what y'all consider relationship and marriage material. Then you wonder why it goes wrong. Not saying that he was right, but it don't seem like she was any better. So you just gonna wake up and choose violent because he played in your face. When did it become too much to just walk away? <laughs> So that brings us right on up to this week's segment of Managing Your Shit for Wellness Waves Wednesday. Let's go. What's going on, Champagne Gang? Welcome to the X-Files Exposed and Wellness Waves Wednesdays, the crossover edition. Yeah. So on last week, we dealt with the lady who found out her husband of seven years was on the down low. And I'm really trying to understand why we still have people on the DL when we're in a day and age where it's accepted to love who you want to. Hell, in this day and age, it's okay to be who you want to be. You can be a cat, dog, horse, man or woman. Because, you know, clearly God didn't know what he was doing when he created you. But, you know, to each his own. But as she stated, she had signs, but she ignored them. She was in love, honey. And a lot of us play the fool for love. We do. And it made me think of something. How much time do we really spend getting to know our significant other? How much? Do we really know who we are laying down with? Or do we realize that we are sleeping with the enemy when it's too late? Uh Uh-huh. But this is how we end up broken and devastated because we invested in someone that hadn't shown us they were worth the investment. What did they say? What did they do to show you they were worth a couple of fab? Did you stop to think about what your life would be five years from now with this individual? Did you have conversations about the future and what it would look like? Or did you get the pecka and the putty tat? and just got stuck on stupid. Look, it's okay. We've all done it at one point in time or another. We have, but when you know better, you do better, right? So scoot up for a second so we can know. Now remember our definition for relationships. Relationships are two people on a ship learning to relate because you can only relate to one person at a time. No matter how many people are on the ship, your relationship with one individual is different from your relationship with anybody else. Even if you have several siblings, even though you love them all, you relate to them all in different ways. And some of them you don't relate to at all. (laughs) You're just associated by blood. Come on now. Don't act like you get along with everybody in your family. Be honest. Some of those creatures you just don't like. Look, I've told God a few times, where were your antennas? (laughs) <laughs> when you set me in this family. Kendrick Lamar said they not like us. No, nah, I'm not like them. <laughs> we don't think the same, act the same, behave the same. I love them, but I can't relate to all of them. But even with family, how much time do we spend getting to know them? We don't. We accept them because they are family. But do you truly know them? Have you invested time getting to know them? So that's what we're discussing on today. Getting to know your ship. Who is the co-captain of your ship? Because that will determine the direction the ship is going to go in, right? So first, we're going to deal with intimate relationships. So let's start here with the law of attraction yeah attraction is the power of evoking interest pleasure or liking for someone or something so you realize you're attracted to them right but what piqued your interest and when it was piqued what about it caused you to pursue a relationship these are questions you must ask yourself before embarking on a journey as permanent or should be as marriage because if you jump ship after it's already left the dock Well, now you'll have to deal with sharks and the treacherousness of the water itself. You have to swim back to a place of safety, which exerts strength in itself. And then you wonder why you're so drained. See, just as the ocean is filled with unknown depths, strong currents, and the possibility of dangerous encounters, 
Leaving the safety of relationships plunges you into the unpredictable waters of uncertainty. See, in a relationship, the ship symbolizes the safety and structure built by two people learning to relate, steering together, navigating storms together, enjoying the calm seas together. But when you decide to jump ship, what you're doing is you're leaving behind that shared journey and venturing into the ocean, the open ocean, all alone. And the ocean has challenges of its own. (laughs) The waves, hidden predators, and the struggle to stay afloat, even for the best swimmer. This mirrors the waves and the vastness of the emotional and mental battles you face after ending relationships or jumping ship, trying to find your way back to safety. You'll confront loneliness like the endless horizon, fear like the lurking creatures below, not to mention the sharks in the water waiting to devour you because now you look like prey. You look like easy pickings because you're vulnerable. You'll have to face waves of doubt, the cold currents of loss, the vastness of starting anew. And just think about this. Think about the number of times you've jumped ship and had to wade through the treacherous waters all over again. And God forbid a storm arises when you jump ship. Now you're trying to navigate the waters, in the waters, without a ship, and in the midst of a storm. Sounds different when you compare it like that doesn't it but it's what happens when you jump on a ship not knowing where the ship is going or who you're stuck on the ship with now you know every ship in the water has to have a name right some of y'all ships should be named misery (laughs) the shining final destination jeepers creepers because some of y'all are in real life horror movies and you're going to have to make one of two choices do i abandon ship and take on those waters again or do i stay on this ship and figure out how to turn this horror movie into a love story so what made you invest in this ship with this individual was it their gift of gab well what if those awe-inspiring words don't come as frequently anymore was it money what happens when the money is gone or isn't coming in at the same magnitude it was before? Did that person's touch bring you pleasure? Well, what happens when he or she doesn't touch you as often as they used to? Was it their looks? Ladies, was it his firm physique? Fellas, was it her figure eight Coke bottle shape? Well, what happens when over time that eight turns into a zero and that six pack turns into a keg? Yeah. Will that individual still be attractive to you? Or will your magnet seek something else to attach to? See, these are the things you have to ask yourself about the individual you are on the ship with. What attracted you to this individual? Now, attraction shouldn't be your main focus in your relationship because what originally attracted you to that individual may change. It may have originally been looks, but as the relationship grew, there should have been other things about this individual that you are attracted to beyond just the surface. So if you've been in a relationship for a while, ask yourself, what am I now attracted to in this individual? What attributes or characteristics of that individual can build or fortify a permanent attraction? See, you have to find something in that individual that is greater than their looks, their pockets, their body, or their sexual abilities. Because if these fade or disappear totally, what will you be left with? It's the what happens wins that destroys marriages and relationships. Because if you don't manage your ship, it can crash, it can sink, and both of you will be left shipwrecked. The key is to learn how to combat these what ifs before you even say I do. Learn to combat them in the beginning of the relationship. I know that when we look at an individual, it's the physicalities of that individual that cause you to take pause. There's nothing wrong with that. But relationships are two individuals on a ship learning to relate. I can't relate to you physically because we are so physically different. I can be attracted to you physically, but that's not how I relate to you. I relate to you mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Which means I have to connect with a part of you that I cannot readily see. Uh-huh. I must get to know you and you me 
from the inside out and not the outside in. There must be something embedded on the inside of both of you that is so strong that no minute detail or distraction can break or interfere with it. You have to know within yourself that this individual is the perfect package. Not that the individual is perfect, but that the individual is perfect for you. You have to see that person as beautiful, even in the midst of their imperfections. See, we go into relationships expecting people not to have flaws. We're all flawed. My flaws may not be yours, but we all have them. So we have to stop this theology that you're looking for the perfect man and the perfect woman. Because number two, no one's perfect. But number one, in order to qualify for perfect, you'd have to be yourself perfect. Perfect means inability to be flawed. If you drop it, throw it toss it, hit it, it will not flaw. That's perfection. None of us are perfection. None. The only thing we can do is strive for perfection. And if you are in a relationship, you should be striving for perfection together. When I give myself to you, I give you my good, my bad, and my ugly, and everything in between. And you have to be attracted to it all. It's a package deal. You don't get to choose a particular part of me to fall in love with. But see, that's what we do. We fall in love with not the total person. We fall in love with aspects of individuals. As if we can leave the rest that we're not in love with on the table. Every day isn't going to be a bed of roses. It won't. And you will not always agree with the actions of the other. That's not how it works. But your attraction to that person and your desire to make it permanent has to be so strong that you see past what you don't like because of everything you do like without holding what you don't like against them. It's the only way to develop a sound, solid relationship. And then you work on what you don't like so it can become what you do. See, that's what a team is. The Bible says, and the two shall become one flesh. I'm working on me and you're working on you so that we can become one. If you look at a person and all you see is their flaws, but not their positive qualities, then you have to question why you're with that individual. If the person you are with can only point out your negatives with no regard for your positives, then you have to question their true intent for being with you. No one wants to be on a ship with someone who can never see or say anything good or positive. But when you're constantly jumping from ship to water and water to ship and ship to water again, only to be quote unquote rescued by another ship, you start comparing ships. Well, my last ship, my last co-captain, Or you can't focus on the ship you're on because your mind is still stuck on the previous ships that you left. You haven't given yourself a chance to heal. You haven't given yourself a chance to recuperate from the exhaustion of traversing through treacherous waters. You haven't even made it back to land to relax and gather your thoughts and assess what went wrong. Just off to the next ship we go and we wonder why. Our relationships aren't working because the ship isn't an investment. It's a rescue. Uh Uh-huh. It's meant to take you back to safety, but you fell in love with the rescue. And when you realize that it wasn't any better than the ship you just left, you found yourself further from safety than you were when you jumped off the last ship. So now we need to have a conversation about availability because how available are you right now? Not how single, but how available are you? Because there is a difference. Availability is the quality of being available. It means present and ready for immediate use. When we look at the definition of these words, we must ask ourselves, how available are we and how ready are we for immediate use? Now, we're going to approach this from two different angles. The first is, the problem with many of us is that we are too ready for immediate use. And we wonder why we leave relationship after relationship feeling used up. If you're tired of being used at some point, you have to limit your availability and how present you are for being used. 
See, this is a you thing, not a them thing. If you show her your finances and your vehicles first, how can you get mad at her if that's all she wants from you? That's what you presented. That's what you made available so you attracted to you individuals who wanted you only for what you made available. If you show him your body and you capture him with sex appeal and sexual skill, how can you get mad at him when all he wants from you is your body and the sex that comes with it? He took what you made available to him. Get it? Watch this. Let me make it live for you. If I need something to write with and a pencil is lying next to me on a desk, guess what? I'm going to grab it and use it because it was readily available to satisfy that need. That's how you are viewed when you are easily accessible. You become something to use in that moment and toss back on the dresser. Because average pencils satisfy average needs and average comes a dime a dozen. But if what I am doing requires me to use a black pen, I'm not just going to grab the pencil. What I need is specific and I refuse to get through and have to start all over again because I settled for what was there instead of finding what would fulfill the need, which was a black pen. Get it? Now watch this. God forbid you're like me and you can only write with a specific type of pen. <laughs> Any black pen won't suffice. People who don't understand would just say, girl, won't any black pen do? My response to them would be no, because my necessity is more complicated. My handwriting doesn't come out the same with just any black pen. Because I'm funny about the look of my penmanship, I have a special type of pen that I write with. I hold my special pen with special regard and I limit access to it because losing it or running out of its ink is going to affect me more than it will affect someone else using it because it holds importance to me. That's how you want a man or a woman to view you. You want them to see you as someone so precious, so priceless that they have to hold you with special regard because losing you is going to affect them more than anything else. That's also how special you should consider yourself. I should hold me, my goods, my presence, my treasure with such special regard that letting just anyone use me and have my goods in the end, is going to affect me more than it would affect them. That's how you want to be. You want to be searched for, not easily accessible like everything else. And you should want someone who fits your need and not someone who only temporarily satisfies. Otherwise, you'll find yourself constantly going from ship to ship, grabbing a hold of the temporal and never obtaining the permanent. Or you get stuck in permanent based on temporal satisfaction. Uh huh. See, many times we meet someone with whom we have an interest and we put everything we are and have on the table, never taking the time to find out if the individual is even qualified to handle who we are, who we were, or whether they are capable of handling what we have to offer or even worthy of sharing our most valuable assets with. At some point, we have to get to a place within ourselves where we know our worth so much so that we are comfortable with who we are and don't feel the need to prove to anyone else that we are worthy of their time or energy. I did this. Now, y'all know I'm transparent with the purpose. So let's talk about me real quick so y'all won't get upset that I'm talking about y'all story time so I met this guy and at the time I was going through a divorce not divorced but going through one and he was fine I mean fine fine <laughs> long locks deep dimples handsome muscular and I fell in love love we spent time together I spent nights at his house now at the time I was extremely insecure because in my mind why would this guy choose me I was young I didn't really know my worth so we started being intimate right we started talking never had a conversation about what this was or where we were going you know what this journey was that we were even trying to embark 
upon. We were just together, right? Now, I'm one of those who God never allows anything to happen to me without notifying me. So people would talk about me and the conversation would be accidentally sent to me. You know, stuff like that, right? That's how God does me. And I might not ever tell you that I know what was said. I'm going to just move different. But one day, I was with him. He asked me to set up his phone. Now, he's 10 years older than me. So, I might have been about 32 at the time. He was 42. So, while I'm setting up his phone, I see a message scroll across the top. And it says, Daddy, are you coming home tonight? But it wasn't his daughter. My spidey senses go off. But I don't say anything. I don't even pretend to see it. But... I store it in the back of my memory. So one day I'm chilling at his house and because I set up the phone, I have the password. So he sleep on the couch. I get his phone. I go through the messages. Now press pause. I'm not a jealous chick. I'm not. I don't even trip over guys having female friends because to me, if someone can break up what we have, then it was fraudulent to begin with. So I don't trip on stuff like that. I was always told if you give a person enough rope, they'll hang themselves, right? So I don't look for stuff to go wrong. I don't go searching for a problem. I give a person that I'm dating or a friend a clean slate from the beginning. But now if I feel like you're trying to make me jealous or something is presented to me, now I'm looking to know how to protect myself. So while I'm looking through his phone, I see message upon message from women talking about sexual encounters and when you coming back to get it and was it good just all kind of stuff again I don't say anything a few days later while I'm retwisting his life I asked him are you seeing someone else and I told him before you answer I want you to know I went through your phone and I saw messages from other women now I apologize to you because it was your property but when I saw the message scroll across the top of the screen I had to know he never addressed what I saw in the phone but he told me he was disappointed in me because he never expected me to be that chick (laughs) to go through his phone so that passes then one day his family is in town he invites me over to meet his family his sister invited me to come by the next day for dinner I said okay and I waited for the call that he was going to pick me up so I never received a call right but the call I did receive was a pocket dial Uh I could hear him get out of his car go up to the door knock on the door and when the door opened I could hear him singing I'm about to dive in you know (laughs) so I'm listening right sound on mute (laughs) I could hear her fussing at him saying nah ninja you playing with me not answering the phone I know you messing with someone else he like girl stop tripping I've been at work so he starts talking about how good she looked in her red dress the night before so then I started hearing light moaning Mm -hmm. now I know she said she had kids so I'm sure she was trying to be quiet but he still doesn't realize his phone is on I could hear the bed creaking so after a while I just hung up tried to call him but of course the phone was dead so the next morning he calls me like why didn't you call me to pick you up I was waiting on your call didn't say anything so he like just come over so you can get your plate before I have to leave so I get up go to his house we're sitting there and he hands me the plate he asked me what's wrong because he could tell my disposition was different so I told him your phone called me last night he said so what did you hear I'm like don't play with me you know exactly what I heard (laughs) so he's like I was at my brother's house I said oh yeah so who was the woman you were talking to he says you must have heard my brother's wife so I said so you told your brother's wife she looked sexy in the red dress the night before so he starts trying to convince me that he was his brother he tells me I like my sex clean and it triggered me because that's what he said to one of the girls in the message when I looked in his phone she was accusing him well one of them because several messages but she was accusing him of cheating and he told her the same thing now here's the thing because I wasn't completely free because I was going through a divorce I said okay I'm not going to trip because there's no way we can be solid anyway until this is finished so it is what it is so then I get divorced we're still together my spidey senses start tingling again he would go days without texting or calling he started accusing me of cheating because I always wanted to be near him or under him 
I was heavily in the church and I would ask him where he was because I was a prayer warrior. And if I'm praying for God to protect my children, why wouldn't I pray for God to protect my significant other? So I would always tell my children, wherever you're going, let me know where you are because my prayer is going to cover you where you told me you were going to be. So why wouldn't I do the same for my man, right? So he would say things like, I'm trying to keep tabs on him. So I stopped asking. I was, (laughs) y'all... I was in love, stuck on stupid. I love the air this man breathed. So fast forward, we stayed together almost 10 years until one day I woke up and I realized that 10 years had passed, but I didn't have anything to show for it. It was like the wool had been snatched off my eyes and I woke up and I walked away and never looked back. Till this day, he tells me I left him because I was cheating and I was never real with him. And I told him, love, see, you're not dealing with the insecure little girl that you were dating 10 years ago. Use that reverse psychology shit on somebody else. I played the fool, but I called foul on the play and I walked away. But here's the thing. I really couldn't get bad at him. Do you know why? Because he never promised me exclusivity. He never promised me forever. He never told me I want to make you my wife. I want it forever. I wanted to sail the seven seas with this man. I wanted to ride off into the sunset. I was holding on to the thought of what we could be without the assurance of what would be. And isn't that what we do in relationships? We go all in without even knowing if the individual we are pursuing is willing to go all in as well. You know how I'm always talking about accountability? I had to take the L on that because I made myself available to be used. I jumped on a ship with this individual not even knowing where the ship was going and not fully being free from another ship. So who should I truly be mad at? him or myself let's be honest how many times have we ended up hurt because our choice didn't choose us back i mean if we gonna talk about it let's talk scoot up it wasn't that he didn't want me he just wasn't going in the same direction he wasn't done sowing them oats and honey (laughs) he wanted me when he was ready to settle down which he wasn't ready to do yet and he thought that i would stick around and wait until he was done because you know That's what me ma them used to do back in the day. Many of us put so much on the table because we want to prove to the other individual that we qualify. That's what I did. I wanted so bad to prove to him that I was worth his love, that I was willing to put up with everything he was dishing out just to say I have him. Did I have his time? Yeah, but so did other women. Now, I was the only one who had access to his house, but that didn't mean he didn't have access to others. Did I have his pecker? Yeah, but so did others. So we were on a ship together, but there was plenty of stowaway. (laughs) The other part of being available is this. Are you truly available to get in a ship? Watch this. If I want to take a cruise, right? I need to check the weather. I need to make sure I don't have to work. If I have children, I need to make sure either I have someone to watch the children or that the cruise ship is equipped with the amenities for the children. I need my swimming suit for the deck pool. How am I going to get to the cruise? Am I going to fly or drive? Take a bus? What money do I have to make sure I have a good time? The kids have a good time. Are we going to do any excursions? What are the deals? How many days can I be gone? Does my job offer paid vacation or will I lose money taking this trip? Can I afford to take this trip? Will it hurt me financially? How available am I right now to go on this cruise? It's the same with relationship. How available are you to get in one? Because relationships are more than just sex. I don't care if he banging it from the window to the wall. I don't care if she's slurping it like a push pop. Relationships built off sex will not last. Said what I said. Because you have to find something that holds you after you get up. After you clean off. After you turn the light back on, can you stand on the deck of your ship with this person on your arm for the world to see? 
So how available are you for a relationship? Are you emotionally va- available? Have you reconciled within yourself the last relationship is done? Because if you can't think of that person without feeling pain, you're not done. If you can't see that person without feeling something oozing up your spine, you're not done. If you can't touch that person without feeling your heart melt, you're not done. You're still a ghost on that ship, even though your body is trying to board another one. Your heart can't be in one place while you're trying to give it to someone in another. Are you mentally available? Have you regathered your thoughts from that previous relationship? Or are you constantly thinking about what would happen if? Full of regrets. If you are, you're not mentally available. Do you get angry every time you think of that person? If you do, you're not mentally available. Because your new ship needs all of you. How can you possibly be available for a new relationship when your heart is in one place, your mind is in another, and your body is somewhere else? The Bible says, and the two shall become one. That means in order to be two, I have to be whole. You have to be whole. And we merge our wholeness together and we become one. Same aspiration, same desire, heading in the same direction. I can't do that if I'm not whole. So you have to make sure you are truly available for what you're trying to embark upon and not desperate for it. Because we do some dumb stuff. We make some dumb decisions out of desperation. Uh huh. We do. We settle for anything when we're desperate. We fall for anything when we're desperate. And this means we have to examine ourselves, not the other person, but ourselves to see how ready am I for what I say I want. If you want to find out the intention, listen, pay attention. But you can't listen if you're not communicating. It's a true statement. Let a person talk long enough and they'll reveal to you the true intentions of their heart. But if the first thing you show them is your heart, you give them the advantage of knowing just how to hurt you because your heart is not your most valuable asset. It's your most vulnerable asset. In giving your heart first, you give the source of your vulnerability before they see the source of your greatest strength. The strength of a man and the strength of a woman shouldn't be in their sex drive, their finances, or their heart. It should be in the depth of their intellect because it's within the intellect that you learn. See, I'm very sapiosexual. If you can't stimulate me intellectually, you'll never be able to captivate me anywhere else. Within the confines of the mind, you find out who a person really is because how they think dictates the way they process situations and information and their true intentions concerning you. Now don't get me wrong, it's natural for a man and a woman to desire each other. That is something that God placed on the inside of each of us. The desire is not the problem, but too much desire without the confines of self-control mixed with too much availability gives you a concoction based on lust, which is a recipe for disaster. See, lust says, I want what I see and I want it without any obstacles or boundaries and I'm willing to do whatever I must to gain access. But love, love says there's more here than just this that I want to gain access to and I'm willing to overcome any obstacle within my boundaries to gain access to it. Lust is temporal, but love, love is eternal. So is this a love thing or a lust thing? Because see, lust creates obsession and obsession is deadly. Lust is like a drug. You start having insatiable cravings. Can't eat, can't sleep. You're hooked on a feeling. He makes it do things it ain't never done before. And we get obsessed with that feeling and don't want to let it go. That's not love. You become possessive over it and you want to hold on to it. Marvin Gaye said, when I get that feeling, I need sexual healing. That's not love. Sex is the dessert to the main course, which is the love you share. Being overly possessive controlling, smothering, is not love. Those attributes lead to first 48, snapped, 
for my man. Investigation discovered. Lust may kick things off, but it's the love that will keep things going. I want to be intimate with you because I love you. And there is no greater connection between two individuals than during those moments of intimacy because I'm imparting into you part of me and I'm taking into me part of you and we're becoming one that's why a marriage isn't a marriage until you consummate it sex because on a spiritual level you are becoming one but the problem with a lot of us is we might as well join a polygamous ranch because we are married to too many individuals let's talk about it and we wonder why we are all over the place how many people are you allowing to impart into you and how many people are you imparting yourself into that's the question and we're going to continue with the rest of it on next week <laughs> I hope you have enjoyed this week's crossover edition of the X-Files Exposed and Wellness Waves Wednesday. Tune in next week. Same bat channel. Same bat time. If you enjoyed the video, please do me a favor and hit that like button. Consider joining the Champagne Gang and the Fizz Fam. Hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you will be notified when we jump into whichever sector we jump into for another show. Thank you for joining me. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comments. And who knows, next week we'll probably spend a little time answering any questions you may have from this video. Confidants, always remember, if it doesn't cause you to elevate, it's causing you to depreciate, even in those relationships. Now raise those glasses, clink and let's drink, till we meet again. Ta-ta.